sexual swear words. The video certificates are there to give you the chance to make an informed choice. They allow you to have peace of mind and be entertained. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the film. Now designs for that shirt by Double Two. The latest new knitted, the greatest for color and style. That shirt is something else, and it's tapered to fit your body like skin. It's that shirt in Dacron Cotton by Double Two International. Now on release. Some country life, and you'll never put a better bit of butter on your knife. Oh, right, right. Here's the door worm. key, please. I haven't got it. You had it. Didn't. Gave it to you. You never give me anything. I'll give you something in a minute, I will. Look, if we can't eat in, we'll eat out. There's everything we need. Bread, jam, cheese. And lots of lovely country life butter. Oh, smashing. Now, what are we going to do about this door? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> And now, preview time. When it comes to entertainment, you can't beat a good film. So let's take a look at what's coming your way. Do, 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 do. The Lords of Flatbush is a movie do, 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 do. About how life was in the 50s A black leather jacket a rumble or two and a girl cut in school playing pool stealing a car record hops bobby socks a padded bra the lords of flatbush oh it's something to see do, 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 do. it's full of memories for you and for me i don't mean to boast but you'll do Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Perfect Movie. Please welcome your host, Richard Sandley. I mean, you know, please carry on, but stop. Welcome. Welcome to Perfect Movie with me, Richard Sandling's Perfect Movie. My goodness, that was that was smooth. If you could have seen the panic backstage of me going, I don't know what's happening. And it's now we're here and it's happening and there's nothing I can do about it but carry on as if it's all going well. Congratulations. Welcome, people. Welcome. Ah, oh, fantastic. This is Richard Sandling's Perfect Movie. Uh, the show about loving films is about people's enthusiasm for cinema. Uh, big hello to everybody out there uh, watching live on Facebook. Big hello to everyone watching at a later date on YouTube. Uh, if you are on Facebook, remember to send in some comments, send in some questions. We'd be delighted to know uh, what you're thinking. Ask some questions, have some opinions. We'd love to hear from you. We'll read them out as we go through the show as best I can. Um, one of the things I would like to ask you, if you have any, I know it would be a bit tricky to put this in, like a Facebook comment, but if you have any experiences, uh, or weird experiences in a cinema, uh, preferably ones that aren't harrowing or uh, illegal, 
Uh, that would be uh, that would be fun. We'll be talking about that in a minute. Uh, for those of you who've never seen this show before, like people, what is a perfect? Like, what is perfect? What is a perfect movie? A perfect movie is uh, basically it's your favourite film. Uh, not the best film you've ever seen necessarily, but your favourite film, the film that you just love, the film that if anybody at any point of the day would say, let's watch that, you'd be like, yes, I love that film. Uh, a film that if it finished, as soon as it finished, you could watch it again because it's just that good. Um, that's the sort of film. Again, I will ask some of you in the front row, maybe I'll ask some of you on Facebook. Remember, there are no right or wrong answers. Uh, some answers are less wrong than others. Uh, some <laughs> answers are more correct than others, but there are no right or wrong answers because it is your favourite film. So no one can prove you wrong. Uh, that'd be nice to hear that. We're going to talk to some people in a minute. And then what we have at the end, we have uh, a special guest. We'll talk about films and they'll choose their favourite beginning, middle and an end from movies, thus putting them together so they get to create and be part of their own theoretical perfect movie, uh, which is a very exciting thing to have. And we'll all recreate them live on Zoom, which is quite exciting. People are like, oh, you know what you should recreate? And they're like, what? The opening to Saving Private Ryan. And I'm like, well, A, the opening to Saving Private Ryan is an old man walking around a graveyard. You mean the <laughs> scene in uh, Saving Private Ryan when they storm the beaches at Normandy, I'm thinking. But also, <laughs> and neither of those work via Zoom when we're all sat in a room thousands of miles apart. So these are largely uh, the greatest conversational pieces from, <laughs> uh, from movies. It's very difficult so, to do the opening to X-Men 2. Uh, <laughs> there are just some things that don't really, really work. Uh, well, you know, I, I mean, I'd give it a go. I'd give it a go. But it's not, you know, we get some blue paint, float off there. I mean, I'll give it a go. Maybe we'll just do one one week. We'll do the impossible Zoom show. We'll just get <laughs> in front row. We'll all do it. It'll be like a weird, like, be like one of those stuntmen fights. We'll just do a scenes you can't do in Zoom thing. I don't know. I'm blathering. But it's lovely to see you all. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, it's the uh, 45th anniversary of Jaws being released. Woo! Nice. Woo! 45 years old, eh? 45. <laughs> oh, just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water. Amazing. That was the film uh, 45 years ago. A film about a terrifying danger that is ignored for commerce. Uh, <laughs> no, you realise the, the mayor is the bad. You know the mayor's the bad guy. He's the bad guy, right? Just so we're all aware. That's the thing. Do like Jaws. Do like Jaws. Uh, big fan. It's one of those films that I don't know. I don't, has anyone? Has everyone here seen Jaws? Yes. Yeah. Front row seen Jaws. Did everybody see it like as a kid? Mm. Or did no. anybody see it as a yeah. grown up? Teenager. Yeah. So this is the thing I would like to ask because if you watch it as a grown up, if you watch it as a if you watch it as a grown up, is it scary? Because you watch it as a kid and it is terrifying because it's a PG fright fest and you watch it's the sort of thing you watch when you're eight and you're just too young to really be watching it. So when you watch it as a like as a teenager when you're like, is it still like scary? Is the is the head really scary and you know come back here and slop some of this shit and then the shark comes? Is that like ah when you're you know 15, 16? I mean, I would say it's still a moment where you jump, but so it's yeah. not terrifying as if you were if you're like let's say eight or nine years old but still oh. a great movie still yeah, yeah. Movie, but. Do love you. and also it's great great uh great music i like i like the story of um like john williams did the soundtrack and he played it to uh, uh spielberg i think spielberg was like oh that's really good yeah put some put some orchestra behind that a bit of stuff and it was like no that's <laughs> <back."> <laughs> <laughs> it was right but it was like oh that's really i can't laugh because that'll sound great when it's finished <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Okay, uh, but yeah, very nice, very nice. There's lots of other, also it's one of those things where the actual rest of the soundtrack is very good. Everyone always knows the Jaws theme being iconic, but actually a lot of the incidental music uh, is very good. So it's actually a very good soundtrack album, although it does have that thing that classic movies have where it's largely a lot of the theme coming in and out in different motifs and stuff. So it's very good, but yeah, Jaws, good. If we're talking about perfect movies, I think Jaws is one of those movies where Jaws is great. Um, yeah, Jaws is one of those films where like, it's weird because like if you don't like, I can understand like you're not necessarily think George is the greatest one ever, but George is one of those films where it's very hard to sort of believe anybody if they say they don't like Jaws. It's one of those films you go, you can't not like Jaws. It's like it's nothing to not like about it. You might not think it's brilliant, but you have to basically like Jaws. I think that's just one of the rules. Not, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know many rules, but you have to basically like Jaws. I think that's 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 a given. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Good. Good. I'm glad yes, we're all correct. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> 
Jaws. I, think it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, I have a boring Jaws fact. But, uh, boring Jaws fact, Paul, please. Do you want a boring Jaws, Jaws fact? fact? Yes, yes, I do. So, it turns out the series Columbo, starring Peter Falk, was a bit of a Jaws factory. Because as we all know, Spielberg directed the pilot, well, the first episode of Columbo. Uh, great. But then what I realised is that the person who directed the first episode of season three a few years later uh, was the guy who directed Jaws 2. Uh, as you know, Schwartz or something? I, every time I try and remember, I forget. No, you're on your own. <laughs> that, that was a fact, yeah. That was a fact. I that was a boring. fact. That You did exactly what I did ask. Thank you, Paul. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> it is good. The only thing I really remember about Jaws 2 is that the uh, the, the the helicopter pilot's got a really weird beard because he doesn't have a moustache. You know, I remember going, why has that guy got a weird beard? That was the main thing I took from watching Jaws 2 as a younger as a younger man was, that guy's beard's weird. But then he dies, and I'm like, well, I'm kind of not sad because his beard's weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, moving on. <laughs> moving on. I was going to have a little chat. We're going to talk about... Uh, I have to think of things to talk about, maybe in the room, Cin weird cinema experiences, like weird cinema experiences, cinema experiences, watching it with uh, people. Uh, I've had some pretty, uh, I mean, I used to work in a cinema, as I mentioned before, so we have had some odd uh, odd things happen in the cinema. Generally, the weird thing is just stupid questions people ask you. Like, I know uh, people have here have worked in cinemas or been in cinemas. So basically, I have this thing. I remember I was working in the Odeon in South End when Star Wars Episode One: Phantom Menace, came out. Uh, and because it was a massive, it was one of the first times I've been anywhere where it was, it was like multi screens. It was everywhere. It was like yeah, on the hour, ten till ten, like on the hour, ten till ten, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, people come in and they'd be like, oh, what times? Uh, what time is Star Wars on? Then you go, it's, it's on the hour, every hour, ten till ten. Right, right. So, um, folks, coming about half past two. <laughs> Well, you'd, you'd be half an hour early or half an hour late because it's on the hour, every hour, 10 till 10. And they go, so I see you got Star Wars on the hour. It's on the hour 10. It's on like, I see you got Star Wars at 10, Star Wars at 11 o'clock. Does that mean the Star Wars is only 45 minutes long? No. <laughs> You're like, yeah, yeah, it is. It is. I, 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 don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. It's much better. Basically, Sam Raimi doing the Coen Brothers is brilliant. Watch that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it didn't work. And then, but that's the thing is because this is back before, like when you used to come in an order. So we'd have this, we'd have like, like this would be all the times would be behind me. Yeah. So people would come in to like face me and they go, What time Star Wars on? And then I've got to look behind me to stare at the thing they're looking at, to read the thing they're reading, to tell them <laughs> what time Star Wars is. It's just madness. It's madness. Uh, but yeah, I have some weird situations being in cinemas. Uh, one uh, i'm the sort of person where like i'm very grumpy in the cinema i'm, I'm always like ready for the, i'm ready to be annoyed even though no one's done anything i get really i'm like i'm on <laughs> like i'm like i'm just immediately on damage control for everyone who's going to be yeah. a bell end uh i was in one i, mean, I, had, like, I was full oh, had a lovely time I went to see drag me to hell uh in the cinema Ooh, uh, nice. I, you know i went to see it but I, cho I chose badly it was nine o'clock on a friday night so it was just full like the screen was like 400 seats are full like full of teenagers, and I'm like, oh, there's just a talk. It's gonna be. I'm like, you know, why did I like? Yeah. I'm an idiot. But the best thing happened, right? They're all young, because this was around the time of, like Saw and Hostel. So all the par like paranormal activity films hadn't really come out yet. So they didn't really know what scary was. They just knew gruesome and violent. Mm. So they've never seen a scary Doctor Who was their only influx of scary. So they watching <laughs> Drag Me to Hell, they had no idea what to expect or how to process shock and horror and it was like 415 year olds just in complete emotional distress because they couldn't <laughs> drag me to hell there was popcorn flying everywhere there's people screaming like why are you going in there why are you going in there just phone the police why are you going in there it's just like fucking brilliant like i wholeheartedly uh recommend a cinematic experience when you're surrounded by uh 15 year olds completely out of their depth emotionally it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> fantastic uh, i had one other one i'll tell you quickly before i move on uh, I ruined a film. For, I'm the guy. I once ruined a film experience for everyone. Not on purpose. I'm not like deliberately uh, that guy, but I'm <laughs> certainly that guy because uh, I saw the first Twilight film. Uh, not why, snob. Why? 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 Why did well, you like do vampires? That? I'm old school. <laughs> uh, I was of an age where vampires just killed people. I had a bit of a sword fight, so you know I wasn't expecting <laughs> this, uh, and it was fine. It was already a bit dodgy. 
like uncomfortable because I went in there and it's basically loads of 14 year old girls and their mum <laughs> and then me which is not like, not great. <laughs> very <laughs> much the vibe I get when I do Pilates do you know it's like <laughs> you, you do <laughs> Pilates say women only but maybe read the room Rich read the room and I'm like this is worse for me than it is for you because you're all 80 this is much more weird for me <laughs> the thing is as well, so I'm watching I'm watching um, I'm watching uh, Twilight and what happened was, no one told me uh, it wasn't supposed to be funny. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've seen it, but it is hilarious. It's, it's hilarious. I'm like, I just la I'd like laugh like a drain the entire, <laughs> like, it, there's a bit in it where someone goes, are you hungry? I think it's like, it's literally so, it's something like, are you hungry? And then someone says, no, my stomach's full up with butterflies. <laughs> I'm like, tell me that's not on purpose. That's fucking brilliant. It's like, <laughs> Like just like, if I'd have been smoking a cigar, it would have been like Cape Fear. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's awful. But do we have anyone here, Chris? Do you have any uh, cinema experiences? Yes. Yeah, so years ago, when they had the first paranormal activity movie, I was in the cinema in Romford, the View Cinema, and it was very, very empty apart from me and this really like he was a very well built guy and his really sort of tiny girlfriend. And when it's going through like the first night, he's like, he's sort of, you see him jump in his seat when he gets the first hint of fear. By the third night, he is literally, he doesn't know whether he wants to be in the cinema screen or not. So he keeps going backwards and forwards between where his girlfriend is and the door. By the next night, night in the film, he can't even go through the corridor because he's too scared because he thinks something's going to get him. And then, so sort of, I think about halfway through the film, his girlfriend literally had to escort him out because <laughs> he was terrified. So it's like, and it was amazing because this guy, like, you'd think he'd be the perfect bouncer, but he was terrified. And this little girl literally just had to like drag him out and sort of help him. He was, he was in, he was so distressed. He was absolutely distressed. It was well, films hilarious. Do get you. Film, films do get you. I mean, you are allowed to be scared, but yeah, that is a bit, you know. I mean, I was like five. I saw Ghostbusters. I'd never really seen a film before. And you, what, imagine you'd never really seen a film before and you watch Ghostbusters and then the bit in the library happens where the old ghost lady goes, Rah! it's like just she, like, <laughs> just ran out the back of the cinema and just <laughs> hit the entire time. I was amazed. I'm amazed my mum ever took me back to the cinema. Another <laughs> 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 good one as well. And that is, uh, a friend of mine was, uh, he used to do like publicity stunts for movies. <laughs> and so they were doing a press screening for It Follows. And my friend is like a very tall guy. He's like one of the tallest guys in the UK. He's about like seven or eight foot high. He's like massive. <laughs> so there's that scene in the movie where the big guy just like is like beyond behind the door and oh, everyone right. uses it so you imagine you've got the whole cinema of people and then he suddenly bursts out and just walks up the aisle <laughs> and everyone just like <laughs> screams because they think the movies <laughs> come out to get them <laughs> oh, and i was literally brilliant. just waiting for that point he said yeah wait till about like 45 minutes in and you'll, you'll see me coming. Uh, oh, it was great. It was absolutely it's proper great. Like, it's a proper like 50s, you know, shock cinema. That's a proper like matinee stuff right there, isn't it? You yeah, know? William Castle-like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, old, the castle, the old, yeah, the tingle in the chair. Mm. Yeah. That's pretty sweet. That's pretty sweet. Have one more? Have one. Don, you work in a cinema. You must have some madness that is, yes. that is not harrowing or illegal. <laughs> <laughs> So it when doesn't they, uh, involve the police needing to be called or should have been called. Well, I mean, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, I came in one morning at 5 a.m. very early uh, to unlock the door to go in and start doing inventory for the kitchen. And I walked past the movie theater, and this is when the new Bad Boys came out, and I hear it playing. So I go inside thinking maybe the janitors are slacking off or something. There's nobody in there. The movie's just playing with the lights on. I was like, okay. So I go upstairs to the booth, turn it off. The movie's not playing. No. Oh, okay. So I go back down. I, I start counting stuff and I hear something and I go look and the movie's playing. It's like, are you kidding? So I go back upstairs and the movie's not playing. Oh. <laughs> so I completely unplugged the projector 
<laughs> Luckily, it didn't play again because that would have been. <laughs> yeah. I like the idea of a ghost being really into Will Smith vehicles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I simply have to watch the new Bad Boys for Life. I haven't seen Martin Lawrence on the screen for a decade. The thing is, though, it's like 5 a.m. It's getting light, so he's probably having to wind down after a long night haunting. Mm. So he thinks, I'll just nip in the cinema before they open, catch the new Bad Boys movie, and then, uh, oh, Bad Boys, the new Will Smith movie that is Bad Boys. <laughs> Nobody believed me. I, mean, I would just watch so. I would just hang out in cinemas. I mean, that's that's like because just nothing like pa not paying to watch films in the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we, we could all it, but I don't. But it's like to get get in a cinema for free. That's 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 the sweet spot. Hmm. So we yeah, the digital uh, scheduling later, and it never shows any movie was playing. So nobody believes me. <laughs> the thing is, why would it? Why would you lie? Why would you pick Bad Boys yeah. for Life as the root yeah. of the lie? <laughs> there are other films you could choose. Yeah. Bad Boys for Afterlife. That there we go. <laughs> <laughs> There's your out. Wow. There we go. Oh my goodness. So before we move on, have we got any questions from the Facebook uh, page? Uh, yes. So uh, we've got quite a few, but there's one that I think is probably a very film nerdy um, thing, mainly because I don't understand it. <laughs> so um, Darren Nuttall says the cinema showed the trailer for The Brood by mistake before The Black Hole. Never been quite the same since. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, The Brood is a David Cronenberg uh, Canadian yeah. horror movie, which is not suitable for a, a like a UPG Disney movie. Even the trailer would not be appropriate. I remember when I went, I forget what me and uh, the family were going to go see. I think it was probably something like Kindergarten Cop. And I remember it was it was a film that came out the same year as Predator Two because you had to like look at the you know how they put the actual you know lettering on the cinema screen, and both screens had Predator Two on them, and one of them wasn't Predator Two. One of them was Kindergarten. <laughs> And we had to decide which one we were going to go and see. And so we chose correctly and chose Kindergarten Cop. But I was too young. I mean, obviously, there you go. It would have been cool, but it wouldn't have been cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Do you like, I mean, I, I, do have a, I should say I do have a soft spot for Predator 2. Uh, very, very, I mean, I like it. I like it. I think if you hadn't seen Predator, you think Predator 2 was brilliant. Yeah. It's only not brilliant because it's the sequel to Predator, which is, as we all know, the greatest film ever made that isn't, <laughs> that isn't, isn't crack. <laughs> so, uh, Phil, Phil so we'll, we'll, we'll anything else from the Facebook group before yeah, we? Uh... Phil Clements has had a couple of quite violent experiences in the cinema. He's 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 given I two. The first it. one is I once went to a cinema with friends, and one of them tried to set fire to his seat, and the oh. other unscrewed his seat and threw it across the room. I didn't go to another film with them. And, and well, I'm sorry, is he confusing he his life with the mods and rockers scene of like the 1960s? <laughs> no, no. I know it's completely wrong, but I do want to know what those films were. <laughs> Phil, Phil, no, that's tell us totally what the films irrelevant. Are. Sorry, sorry, I didn't. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what they are when he comes through with them. But he also okay. says, I went to see Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas and the projector burnt through the film in the last 15 minutes and no one was sure if it was part of the film or not. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Gremlins 2 effect. Yeah, yeah that's what That's what we're here. <laughs> so we're going to move on. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, are we ready for an act? Oh, yes. yeah. Are yeah. we ready for an act? Yeah. <laughs> well, we need a film quote to shout out. Uh... I don't know what the best film show. Yeah, tell you what, I'm gonna. Oh, this after three because it's the 45th anniversary of Jaws. Let's shout! You're gonna need a bigger boat. Uh, <laughs> obviously, it's quite a. You know, the point about it is, it's a very uh, un. It's a very restrained line, which is what makes it so effective. We're gonna completely <laughs> ma like mangle that by screaming it really loudly. Uh, you're gonna need a bigger boat after three. Are we ready? Oh yeah. And do it at home as well, so everyone's gonna wonder why you've got boats in your front room. <laughs> One, two, three. We're, We're going to need a bigger, bigger, bigger boat. Bigger boat. Oh, yes, yes, excellent. That's 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 exactly how it's like in the film. Well, everybody, <laughs> start uh, start uh, a round of applause. Start walking. Start cheering and welcome, Mr. Paul Gannon. Yeah. Hey, Paul. I'm giving myself my own applause. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So it has been a while since I've done anything based on movies at all. Because I, ha I haven't done movies lately. The last film I saw was Knives Out, and the previous film before that was 2016's Ghostbusters. It's been a roller coaster. So, um, 
<laughs> what I thought I'd do instead is, um, first of all, one second, because I thought I've had it and it's just there. It'll be five seconds of nonsense. So here we go. One, two, three, <laughs> four, Seamless. five, six, seven. Only seven seconds of your time wasted. So it's one job. I know, right? <laughs> but I like to have that professional unprofessionalism that everyone knows me so well for. So what I thought I'd do is I'd reach into the bags and boxes I've got around my flat um, because I've been collecting a lot of charity shop stuff and see if that inspired me today to do something movie-based. And I think I have. So first point of order, I found something uh, online that I'd wanted for years and I lost it and then I found it uh, and I wanted to show it off because back in the day when a film came out, you probably didn't see it again after the cinema, unless you loved going to the cinema for another like nine months until VHS. And you thought, oh, how can I get my fix of films? So some people had different ways of doing it. And one toy for company called, oh, uh, well, it actually it was a brand that got sold to Galoob and other country uh, uh, toy factories like that. But it's this. Have you ever seen one of these before? It is an instant replay. It's a little film cartridge on a kind Terminator of. Two. It's, this is this is a Terminator 2 clip that you play through one of these. And I remember having these as a kid. But when I told my friend, or you know, friends recently, uh, about them, no one seemed to remember them. So I came across these on eBay, bought it, didn't work, fixed it. Thank God for YouTube. I've learned so many life skills, uh, but not social ones. So I don't know if this will even work on this camera. No, oh, I don't think it's oh. going to work, is it? No. Oh. Oh, oh. <laughs> Look at this. You can see. No, you can no, see I it. can't. Paul. You can. You can oh. definitely see it. Paul, this well, is a little bit. That's, oh. The shame is, it's a really good moment because it's the moment in the film where the T1000 jumps from his bike into the helicopter and says, oh. Get out. So, with that in mind, I thought I'd stay in the 80s for this segment. <laughs> oh, I'm done. So, another thing that I'm obsessed with recently is collecting uh, a magazine that was popular in the 80s called Looking Ooh, Magazine. Wow. Ooh. Yes. And I have a massive stack of these. But what I thought <laughs> would be interesting would be to go through them and just have a look at how we saw film back in the 80s. Well, I would say the heyday of Hollywood blockbusters. Mm. I'm going to put an argument out there and say the last great 80s summer blockbuster was Who Framed Roger Rabbit, and I'll die on that hill. Um, so I'm going to go through them because obviously it was looking for those who don't know. Looking was a, uh, a TV guide for kids, focused mostly on the children's programming, things that would be interesting to kids, from sports, movies, to toys, to all sorts, comic strips, uh, listings for TV shows of the week for kids, and all sorts of things. However, it is the delightful, weird parts of like marketing back in the day where, for instance, get to know. Timothy Dalton, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Get to know Timothy Dalton. Because, you know, he's Hang the new Bond. You know, we've just come off Roger Moore. And, you know, we, we all love watching May to December with handguns. But Timothy Dalton was taken over. But I love all this because, it's you know, for instance, there's a fact file on him. And your idea is you're meant to cut these out, the back pages, and store them in a binder of your choice. Uh, let's find out. Birthday, 21st of March, 1946 is when he was born. He's an Aries, that's very important. Uh, born in North Wales. Um, what was he like in his childhood days? He liked playing football and getting into trouble like normal lads. I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, he enjoys fishing. His first major film role, does anyone know what his first major film role was before I reveal it? Was he... No, I don't know. No. Apparently, according to Looking Magazine, the most authority on <laughs> Timothy Dalton material, it was King Philip of France in A Lion in Winter. Oh. Uh, and, and also, if you're really interested, his favourite car is Toyota. <laughs> that is a fact I mean, on there. I mean, I, think, I, th I mean, we all know that. Yeah, whether he stands by that to this day, we just don't know. Yeah. Uh, so one of the other things I loved about Looking Magazine was that it uh, had a reader's uh, a writing thing where you could write it and have a complaint or support something that you liked on TV. And basically, I like get points of view. A little page there. I thought I'd read some out because I thought some of them were interesting, certainly when it comes to news. So um, this one simply says, update. It says, I agree with Gareth Penman, who said that Superman and Star Wars are always on TV. I am sick of watching them as well. 
and I would much rather like to see the films Romancing the Stone and Jewel of the Nile. It's a lot more up to date and I'd like to see it at Christmas from R. Zemeckis in Bista. <laughs> it's not actually R. Oh, Zemeckis, but it reads like that's the kind of thing Robert Zemeckis would write. Uh, start watching Star Wars and watch Romancing the Stone, which I haven't seen in a while. Does it stand up? I, mean, I, I haven't seen it. For, I mean, it's it's on film four a lot. I haven't oh, watched. well, there you go. Something a bit of homework for you. What romancing the stone? Yeah. Uh, right. So, more letters, and I found it interesting that one of the major things when it comes to uh, movies uh, was different of opinion. So we got there. I'm sick of watching Star Wars. The following week, I wish Superman was on TV every week. <laughs> But all you usually get is a film show once a year. They should really make a TV series of Superman and show it every week from Rachel Massey in Staffordshire. A complete difference. She doesn't want to see Romancing the Stone. Has no interest in romantic screwball adventure comedies. Um, here's another one from another following week. Where is it, the one I'm looking for specifically? Uh, oh, yeah, it's about violence, because they're talking about violent movies and things like that. I thoroughly disagree, says Alex Thompson. Uh, that there's too much violence in programmes like the A-Team and Bond films. The Bond films don't even start till after 8pm, so young children should be in bed by then. Have you ever seen anyone hurt or killed in the A-Team? Never. Which is good, it's a good point. No one ever, strictly, only one person ever died on the A-Team, apparently. And it was the main villain, and he died off screen, so you didn't even get to see him get iced. In fact, um, a letter follows that up by Amanda Jones, age 11, I disagree with people who complain about violence on TV. If we didn't show films of people going around shooting other people, everyone would think life was very safe. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, in fact, they would have a totally false impression of the world. No kid age 11 uses the word whereas. This is from a woman who's very angry uh, putting this out there because she, she has issues. Um, next, oh, there's my Big Fox family favourites. So here's a great one. This is a great one. I agree with Adam from last week. I wish TV and video people would not show films with violence in. My brother saw Superman 2 once, and there was a scene when a bad man hits Clark Kent in the face. The next day, my brother punched me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> the argument stands up. The argument does stand up. So there's, there's something really adorable about all of this. Uh, if Again, as well, you've got to remember, Looking was also promoting these films to kids. So if you worked in magazines, you probably got a press pack with a bunch of cheap tat that was meant to be there for the journalists to enjoy, but the journalists passed them on as competition prices to uh, the reading audiences of Looking. For instance, here's something you can win from 19... 88. It is you, your chance to win exclusive five Police Academy 5 t shirts. So, if you really want to win one of the a t shirt for one of the greatest films of the summer, then here is your chance. In this episode, Commandant Lassard, having accidentally picked up a bag of diamonds, is kidnapped by thieves, and the famous graduate graduates have to rescue him. Is that Miami Beach? Is that yeah. when they started turning uh, Police Academy films into basically 90 minute long sitcoms? How bad is a film when even Steve Gutenberg is not interested in turning up for it? <laughs> that, is, that is your quandary. Oh, well, I've got a little tab in here. What have I reminded myself to check? Because I've got, I've got hours of material. Oh, no, hang on. Is this a letter? Yeah. I've got hours of these. I've got stacks of these magazines. Squashy Sumo. Well, this is just rude. This, is, this, this isn't movie related, but it kind of just shows you that back in the 80s, kids were just blunt. I think sumo on, channel, sumo on Channel 4 is disgusting. The way they squash and squeeze each other is horrible and revolting, and they are fat. From Tangi La in Argyle. Uh, oh, interesting. E.T. was getting a home release, and you could win uh, E.T. because apparently it hadn't been on sale ever until 1988. Well, no, it would have been like 60 quid, wouldn't it, Gannon? Yeah, they say you can win a VHS in this magazine that would cost you normally £75. Pounds. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Back in the day, because that's when I, I worked in Blockbuster for a while, and yes, they bought the stock and they were expensive tapes, and that's where you make your money on the retail. Um, it's got, it's got, um, out, it talks about ET at the time and when it came out, and it says, 
for the re-release, you won't be able to escape E.T. for a while yet, as he says in the film, I'll be right back. I don't remember that being the quote from E.T., <laughs> I'll be right back. I'm pretty sure it's another one. Um, I'll be right here, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I shall return. Right here, and he touches the heart to say, like, as if, like, yeah. I'll be right back yeah. just sounds like that's like a terrible Schwarzenegger thing, it's isn't just, it? it? They confused E.T. with, like, Conan the Barbarian. Yeah, they've confused it with a, a, a tech cyber tech thriller. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A top brand no of gives red. E.T. a raw deal. <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be a, a, a top brand of bread that will be called ET for the next six weeks the top cola company is giving away chances to ha own an, your own ET oh it's coming home on <laughs> October 25th and there are 15 million envelopes in Britain that have been carrying the slogan ET comes home they posted all that out I find this absolutely if you, you can get as of release of this VHS we're giving baseball caps BMX hats uh Flashlight, key rings, travel clocks, picture discs, single. As we famously know, the uh, ET uh, finger toy you could buy that had a glow bulb on the end. And uh, let's just skip to the point where I say it looked like a cock, because that's the point. Um, I like I like this in looking. Again, they go through the Easter films. What was released in Easter, 1980? Yeah, these are all 88. Uh, oh, batteries not included. You don't get a lot of people talking about that these days. And yeah. battery not included, the little flying robots, the yeah, yeah. cams. We all tried. ITV2. Yeah. Very ITV2. My Christmas. mom had that on VHS and thought by taping it off Sky it was the height of her cinematic collection. <laughs> I've never understood that. Uh, the Princess Bride and Empire of the Sun, another um, Spielberg that we don't talk a lot of. That was Easter. The follow in that year of Christmas, here we go. Basil, the Great Mouse Detective, which is officially the best cinematic representation of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's classic character. <laughs> uh, it is, it is, the fact that Disney do not make more of Basil makes my literal piss boil. Um, it's got two great songs in, one deeply inappropriate for kill children because it's basically a striptease burlesque song, and then Vincent Price selling it like, uh, like the master as Professor Brattingham. Uh, yeah, I'm not even going to talk about it. Howard, a new breed of hero... Hey. Your fave. Oh my god. The first Marvel film, ladies and gentlemen. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. It definitely is. The no, legacy no. runs long with Howard. It all begins there. Not the first. No. It is. No, it is. It is, Rob. It's definitely the first. I read it in a book. I read it in a book, Rob. Um, yeah, <laughs> so, in Christmas, we had Big Trouble in Little China, and it came out the same weekend as Transformers. Which blows my mind. The Transformers animated movie that decided, hey, all those really lovely characters that you love and been invested in on the TV show, uh, let's kill them in the first 10 minutes, really quite violently, and replace them with characters, including Eric Idle. Mull over that for a minute. Labyrinth. And I think, I think that's it. I'm getting to the end of this pile. Other than I wanted to end on this. There's always a new Batman movie these days, it seems. Rob, you're like this. There's always Batman films, because you know what? They never get Batman right, do they? They have to keep trying to get Batman right. <sighs> so, what villains could they do? Well, there's a TV article in here about Batman's oddities, and there's a, some, a couple of villains here that are in the TV show that maybe the films could bring back. For instance, King Tut, who was, <laughs> he was a disgruntled university professor who specialised in Egyptology. But as a result of a blow on the head, he took on the identity of a crooked King Tut. The bump on the head is all that's needed to make him switch personalities. So there you go, that's what he looks like. <laughs> he looks like, I don't know, he looks like Bernard Breslau, to be fair. And I, I don't and although that Robin is jealous of her. Why? Well, that sounds a bit of a setup. <laughs> oh, look, there's, oh, I'm not, there's no setup, it's just uh, King Tut. I've lost the point. Um, one of the villains, Egghead. Vincent Price appears in the segment again. He was a villain for a one or two episodes. The rest of the cast were getting up, fed up with Burt Ward, who played Robin, and he ended up with egg on his face. Is that true? Like, they just got Vincent Price to egg Burt Ward on set. Well, I think Egghead was loosely based on Egg Fu, who, no. Just even then, a massive no. Is this one of those three-man <laughs> shooting? <laughs> we can't do that ever again, can we? Yeah. And maybe my favourite one is The Puzzler. And it's so crap a character that even the writer is three lines, which says, 
he's like the Riddler and sends clues to Batman. And that's it. That's it. The puzzler. It's <laughs> <laughs> the man. He's just... Oh, but that cravat. Come on. To be fair, the cravat alone makes it worthy for Robert Patterson to take on in the next film. And I think, <laughs> without going down too many more rabbit holes, I'm going to call that a day. But that's my dip into the 80s movies. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Hooray! Oh, God. Oh, my word. Looking Magazine. Oh, I used to get Looking Magazine because uh, you got vouchers on the back of Shreddies. And if you cut the voucher out of Shreddies, you've got a free Looking Magazine. So I got a free Looking Magazine. I remember one episode, there was a genuine question in Looking Magazine. Bear in mind, it's for kids. Who would win a fight between Arnold Schwarzenegger and Jean-Claude Van Damme? Because, <laughs> uh, uh, of course, the trick is it's obviously Jean-Claude Van Damme because he's a martial artist. Arnold Schwarzenegger is just, like, hedge. But, but <laughs> you forgot the obvious one, Rich. John Claude Van Damme played the Predator. That's true, for a bit. Well, for a bit, yeah, you for know. A bit. <laughs> when it was uh, when it was when it was spandex. That's like saying uh, that's like saying oh, what was his name? The guy who was in Mask in Back to the Future. Like, oh, he played Marty Eric McFly. Stoltz. Yeah, Eric Stoltz was Marty McFly. He's like, no, <laughs> sorry, Eric. There's no need for that. There's no need for that. Leave Eric Stoltz. <laughs> Not Eric Stoltz. So, have we got any questions? Or have we got any questions from Facebook, Holly? Uh, no, someone just says I like gone bombs. What are gone bombs? <laughs> I don't know, and he hasn't capitalised either of the letters, so it doesn't even sound like it's a film. I was hoping <laughs> it was a joke while I went to make a tea. So you know. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. So we're going to move on. I'd we're going to move Paul on. as my oh, spokesperson. Yeah. We've got. Have we got a spokesperson? I'd hire Paul as my spokesperson. Who is the person me, hiring someone in Facebook? For, for, <laughs> for what? Though? So we're going to play a game. Rob Dibb, do you want to play a game? I'd love to play a game. You win nothing. That's a no prize. Marvel reference. Yes, I love it. Everyone's going to help you. So listen to your teammates. Everyone at home, this is, this is the game. This is the, this is the moment we've all been waiting for. Play your video cards right. Uh, if you're not familiar with the uh, game, there's a... The popular show, play your cards right or higher or lower, where you have to work out whether a, a playing card that's, that's turned over is higher or lower than the one that follows. You have to guess. If you win, you get a prize. Well, I've got the same thing, which is four VHS sleeves of films Ooh. that I own, and okay. you have to guess whether the next one is rated higher or lower on IMDb than the film that starts, that oh. came before it. So, we're going to start. Are you ready? Are you ready, Rob? You win nothing. Yep. Win Absolutely. Nothing. <laughs> I've got nothing. I've got Let's nothing. the screen. Here we go. TV, Richard Sandling has started screen sharing. Play your video cards right. Okay. There we go. So, we're going to go for the first one. Okay. Armed and Dangerous. Ooh. Uh, directed by Mark <laughs> Lester, who also directed Firestarter, Commando, Class of 1984, and a show down in Little Tokyo, and written by Harold Ramis and Brian Grazer. Stars John Candy and Eugene Levy, Meg Ryan, as well as Robert Lozier, Jonathan Banks, Steve Railsback, and because it's an 80s movie, Brian James. <laughs> uh, the original director, Mark Lester, apparently actually left uh, the movie because John Candy wouldn't call Meg Ryan a bitch in one of the scenes and he had a fit and left. Um, it was originally conceived as a vehicle for John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd before John Belushi died. Uh, it was originally then going to become John Candy and Tom Hanks. Dan was going to be Dan Aykroyd, and then it, it basically it ended up being John Candy and Tom Hanks. Then John Candy suggested Eugene Levy. John Carpenter was supposed to direct it at, at some point as well. Uh, Harold Ramis decided, took his name off it because he didn't like it. Uh, so you haven't got to guess this one, Rob. You haven't got to guess this one. It's quite good. It's basically about people who are like a, a disgraced cop and uh, like a lawyer. They become security guards, and then they realise that they work for a, a crooked um, union. Okay. So it's good. It's good. So, uh, mm. yeah, I'm going to guess this one because it's where we started. But what do you think this is worth on IMDb? Ooh, see, mm. Oh, see, see, this is the thing, isn't it? It's IMDb. I reckon it's probably a. I don't know. I don't even know the IMDb ratings. It's out of ten, isn't it, or something? Yes. It's it's, it's, it's point something. So it'd be like. Yeah, something. I think it'll probably be six point three. Okay, okay. We're moving to say, but just one other thing I'd like to point out: if you look at the look at the certificates. You've got, yeah. it's a 15, but it's, you've had to stick the 15 on it because when it came out, it wasn't rated. <laughs> but this is, that's, that's a proper, it's a free certificate release that's had 15 certificates stuck on it. That's pretty cool if you like VHS tapes. So well, it's, it's, it's got, 
one really? of those classics. It's all the elements of every single one of those elements, Rich, makes me want to see that film. But together, whenever you see that all together, you go, and so many directors and so on, it's probably not very good. Well, we'll see, won't we? It's, it's so you can crazy. also confer with your teammates. Yes, your teammates. Okay, right. It's my teammates. Paul, you're the first one I see on the screen, buddy old pal. What do you reckon? I, do you know what? I thought that was a fair assessment. I would say it'd be about no higher than seven, about 6.5. Yeah, thank you. No worries. Anyone else in the team? Got any I'm say 4.1. <laughs> Thanks, Don. 4.1. Have, have you seen it, Don? <laughs> Sorry. I'm uh, yes, on. a long time ago. I vaguely remember it. Uh, I saw it on television, so I would never like sat down and watched it. Right. Okay. What about yourself, Brian, Chris? I think about a 5.2, you know. Yeah. Feel free to the 5-ish. Brian? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I always think that people on IMDb rate films higher than they should be. So that's, I'm going to say I'm, like a yeah a 7.5. Right, I'm I'm the five. I'm gonna stick with the six. Then thank you. Yeah, because that's sort of where I'm going with this. People put in higher. Chris, okay. I think you're yeah. probably right. And Don, being the man who's actually seen the film, <laughs> I'm taking that as the baseline and giving the rate of inflation that IMDb is. Go, I'm going with six. Okay, it is five point seven. Ooh, oh. okay. so we're starting from five point seven. Starting from five point seven, moving on to the next one. Dreams come true. Astral <laughs> projection oh. love story. <laughs> oh, I'll see. Astral projection yeah. love story, directed by a boom operator, also directed the children, and written by the guy who's done nothing else. Uh, stars <laughs> a, stars someone who's basically a professional photographer who did Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston's wedding, and stars a woman who this this is her only credit. Uh, yeah, so basically, it's a it's a sort of as, as, um, astral projection love story. Yeah, it's Medusa. It's a Medusa film. It's a Medusa film. So, what do we think? Do you think this is higher or lower than five point seven? Lower. Think, oh, lower. Oh, it's oh, gotta be lower. Lower. Lower than five point seven. Phil, you reckon it's higher? No. <laughs> it's gotta be lower. <laughs> what are we thinking? Let's go for it. So we're going. We're going lower than five seven. Sorry, mate. Is that lower than five seven? It's higher than five point seven. Paul, uh, uh, lower. Yeah, I think everyone's. Yeah, the it is done lower. It's, it's lower. higher. My God, five point two. It's okay. Don't worry. There's still a chance to win. There's still a chance to win it back. Chud. Chud, can a ballistic humanoid underground dweller? Mm. Yes. A series of sudden disappearances on the streets of New York seems to point towards something unsavory living in the sewers. Directed by the guy who mainly just edits religious documentaries and written by mm -hmm. the guy who's also an author of mysteries but wrote no other screenplays. And is based on a story from someone who also wrote nothing else. John <laughs> 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 Heard, Daniel Stern, Kim Greist, and time for another, let me do my movie drone moment. Um, Check out the cop at the diner at the end. That's John Goodman from Roseanne in an early role. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of love for this movie. Uh, you know, if you keep an ear out for Chud, people often reference Chud, like the content of Chuds will be a thing people reference in pop culture. Yeah. In 2011, as an April Fool's Day joke, Criterion Collection uh, said they were going to be releasing a special edition Blu-ray disc of this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because and then it did also it did however receive a proper like really that did actually happen from Arrow Video uh, a VHS of the Chud can also be seen in the movie Us uh, yes, is so what do we think this is well do you think this is higher or lower higher or lower than 5.9 what do we think oh, higher higher, higher. Anyone, higher. Anyone debate? everyone's nodding Brian nodding Phil oh yeah, yeah absolutely I think higher uh, for sure Everyone no, I'm actually going to say lower. Uh, just really? Uh, no, I like John, you you reckon it's a? Have you have you seen the film? I have not. No, I only know the references to it. Okay, no, that that's f fair enough. I saw it when I was a, like a eight. Video. Yeah, higher, higher. We're going to go higher. Go higher. Higher than five nine. Yeah. And also, look, stick at the eighteens are stuck on. Yeah. <laughs> higher than, than it is lower. Oh, oh yes. What? You got one more chance, one more chance to win. You, well, you don't want to win anything, but you got one more chance to get at least one of them right. You're Letter on. to Brezhnev. <laughs> oh, oh my oh, god. god. Sleeve <laughs> sample for promotional use only, Palace Videos. This is the de debut director Chris Bernard, 
uh, who directed some all quite on the press and front Brookside of My Parents or Aliens TV show, written by the bloke who also wrote Blonde Fist and some Brookside. Stars Margie Clark, Peter Firth, Alfred Molina and Alexandra Pig. Script was written in two weeks and filmed in three weeks. It was produced on a very tight budget and the crew worked on a deferred payment. It's filmed entirely on location in Liverpool. Uh, the world premiere of the film was in October 85. In advance of the copy, uh, countrywide release a month later, in the Knowsley Kirkby Council offices, which had to be adapted for the occasion because Kirkby had no cinema at the time. <laughs> this was the setting for the film's <laughs> worst location for many important scenes. And also, an interesting fact, Alexandra Pig and Peter Firth are married in real life. Aww. Basically, it's a film about Russian soul- sailors who come uh, come uh, like, oh, for like shore leave and then they meet some ladies fall in love and then they try to sort of... She writes a letter to Brezhnev to ask for the so like the so the sailor can come back so they can be together. That's basically what it is. Oh, it's on the town. With the it's on the town. It's songs. on the town. It's like a Thatcherite on the town. <laughs> <laughs> Boys of the Black meets. <laughs> yeah, the it is. That's literally that's that's yeah. So what do we think? Do you think this is higher or lower? What was the lot? Last one was five point six. Yeah. Higher or lower than five point six? What do we think? I think it. I my instinct is higher because it's got that. Body Channel Four late night. She'll be wearing pink pajamas. <laughs> thing about it. Yeah. Um, what do you think, guys? Phil, I remember this being quite popular when I yeah. was younger. I think it might be higher. Yeah. Brian, what do you reckon? Five point six is pretty low for IMDb. I think just statistically, this is likely to be higher. Sure. <laughs> and also, I'd like to point as well, we've got the white 50, the 15 with no red on it, which is also another thing I'm very fond of. Uh, <laughs> um, you've got red on you. So, this is higher. So, Don's reckoning higher, higher as well. Higher. It is. Chris. I higher! Think, yes. yes, you've got one right. Well done. Congratulations, team. <laughs> so, well done. You win nothing, Rob. That was disastrous. Oh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank the team. team. It, was a, it was a group failure, but let's. It was a I'm group failure, but <laughs> I think a special <laughs> mention has to go to Don for actually seeing some of the films. Yeah, uh, we we'll just yeah, yeah, that's very true. true. There. So that and and being proved right about it yeah. as well. So you know, that's an excellent work. So, uh, Holly, do we have any any sort of? Did anybody do better on uh, Facebook? Do we know if anybody won all of those? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'd say my team on Facebook are, are the winners of nothing. Yeah, good, good. That's what I like to hear. Winners of nothing. Winners of nothing. That's fantastic. Uh, Can they have nothing well, each to take home? Yeah, it was nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, before we move on, uh, one thing, Mr. Gannon, Mr. Gannon. Yes. Where can people find you online? Where are you? Where are you? I, I find them. That's the important <laughs> part. I find you. Um, <laughs> if you really want to follow what I do, I do a podcast called Cheap Show with me and my co-host Eli Silverman. Go for the bargain bins, the charity shops, the pound lands of Great Britain, and we look for treasure among the trash. But effectively, it's across between Esther Branson's Slats Life and Derek and Clive. Uh, you can go to thecheapshow.co.uk, Cheap Show on any podcast app you fancy, uh, or follow us on Twitter at the Cheap Show Pod or me at Paul Gannon Show. That's it. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, well, here we are. Is there, is there any anything on Facebook that needs to be dealt with before I move on, Holly? Anything anything pressing from the the gang? Um. Uh, no, sorry. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I think really, I just thought I couldn't be bothered to read for yeah. <laughs> I, just thought, I just thought I should move on, but I don't want them to feel neglected. But actually, it's better. It's better. It's better. <laughs> it is better. Uh, all of those films are worth watching, by the way. Should have that. So, it's time for our uh, our special act. We need, we need one more quote to shout out. Uh that's what I think. Uh, Phil, do you have a quote you'd like us to shout out? Oh. Um, no. <laughs> no. I'm trying to think. There must be something from Salute of the Jugger we can shout out. Uh, I forgot you were better than me. After three. Yes, I forgot you were better than me. <laughs> Excellent work. After three, let's shout that out really loudly. One, two, three. I forgot, I forgot you were better, you were better than, than me. Better than me. <laughs> yes, amazing. So, uh, <laughs> whoop and cheer and start applauding. Woo! Woo! Mr. Brian Wicks. Yay! Brian Wicks. Yay! What's up? Amazing. Hello. Hi. 
Yeah. All right. You welcome, Mr. Brian. Are you are you well? I am. Yes, I am well. I'm healthy. I'm happy. I'm here in Los Angeles, uh, yes. paradise on earth. Everything is great. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So you're here. Uh, to talk about. I mean, do you have any questions based on what's been going on? So far? Uh, well, I do have a uh, a cinema story that nice. I can share with yeah, yeah. with everybody. Uh, this is one that has stuck out uh, stuck with me for years. So I went to see uh, Bad Santa when it came out uh, in the theaters. You, have, you guys all know Bad Santa, right? Classic Billy Bob Thornton uh, movie. And I went to see a 10 p.m. showing on, I don't know, I'd been out for a few weeks. I think I was home uh, uh, for whatever reason from uh, university or maybe grad school. At that When did that movie come out? Early 2000s? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, early, right? yeah, yeah. Cool. It was pretty early, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, late 90s, early 2000s. I can't remember. Anyway, I was back visiting home. I decided to go see a late movie uh, over, you know, winter break. And uh, so I was in a pretty empty theater. And uh, the movie starts, you know, classic, like, R-rated movie for you guys, that's yeah. a 15. Um, and about, I don't know, this is maybe 25 minutes into the movie, there's the scene where uh, Lauren Graham is having sex with Billy Bob Thornton in the car. And she's going, I, I can swear on this, presumably. Yeah, you can. Is that cool? your boots, mate. Okay. <laughs> there's, there's this, they're having sex, and she's going, fuck me, Santa, fuck me, Santa, fuck me, Santa. And just then from a few rows in front of me, what I hadn't seen before, uh, a family gets up <laughs> with two young children that look both <laughs> under the age of 10 and very quickly, but very Oops. quietly exits the, <laughs> the cinema. A 10 p.m. showing of an R-rated movie called Bad Santa. Yeah. So that, yeah. Bad parent, it should have been called. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This country, this and all countries. <laughs> <I know. laughs> We're here to talk to you about your favorite films, your love of films, your enthusiasm yep. for uh, for cinema. Have you always uh, have you always been a film been a film fan? Like, oh yeah, I remember. Uh, I, I I don't know if you guys in the UK. This might actually be what looking is the the analog of. But do you guys have Premiere magazine or did you over there? I don't think so. No, oh, really. I uh, think in the import shops, like Empire, I think was our closest yeah. version of that. Yeah. So I think it probably launched in the mid to late 80s over here. You know, it's just a, a film all about, a magazine, sorry, all about movies. And I remember getting a subscription to that when I was like 10 or 11. And I like very, you know, we would have the box office numbers in the back and all these articles about film. And the one thing I remember, uh, because I was such a big uh, Ghostbusters fan, is an article, a little uh, essay by Harold Ramis called The Life of a Hollywood Hyphenate. And, <laughs> you know, and I probably read this when I was like 11 or 12 or something like this. So, yeah, I've always been uh, obsessed with films. Nice. And do you remember like the first time you watched a movie that made you sort of think like, you know, you're sort of in your formative years, you're like, now I love cinema. Like, so this is the film that's made me go, oh my God, cinema is amazing. Rather than just liking films as a yeah. kid, the film that kind of changed... Uh, yeah, probably. Actually, we've already mentioned it, but it was Roger Rabbit for me, yeah. for sure. I remember seeing that in the cinema. Uh, was it 88? Is that Roger Rabbit? 88. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I would have been 13. And I just remember having this feeling of like, oh, my, oh, my God. Like, I didn't even know stuff like this was possible uh, in, in a film. And so I'd always been, you know, a fan, but that's when I kind of took it up to the to yeah. the next level. Well, probably, it's probably an important film for like when you're younger, because everyone always talks about like, you know, as a youngster, you see Disney films and you see like Bambi's mum get shot and all that sort of spoiler alert, like Bambi's mum gets shot. Uh, but yeah. I remember that really affecting me when I was younger. But I do remember the death of the shoe in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Still, oh God, traumatizing. It still haunts. It still haunts me. <laughs> I just, yeah. Sometimes I just think. I sometimes I just suddenly I'm just a bit of peace and quite suddenly, oh, I remember that bit when they just killed the shoe in Who Frame and I'm suddenly just, oh, that's yeah. horrible. Still, the worst death I've ever seen in the film. <laughs> Absolutely. I think I've when, seen, as like, an adult. Come and see and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> I still think it's the say, shoe. As an adult, the thing to me that's the most surprising about that film has nothing to do with the, you know, the blending of live action and animation. It's the the deals that were worked out on copyright to combine Disney characters with Warner Brothers characters 
right? Like, mm-hmm. I, I, I can't believe they actually have, you know, Mickey and, and Bugs and they're talking. Like, how did they there let that a, happen? There was a it contract was... Yeah. Uh, built up when they were organizing all of this. And Disney and Warner Brothers said Mickey and Bugs can only share a scene if they get the exact same amount of screen time as each other. Right. Same for Daff- Daffy and Donald in their piano uh, yeah. duet thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. There, was, there were things put in place so everyone was walking away happy with the deal. Yeah, nice. Yeah, that's amazing. I'd say the, well, the other it's film... So easy to go, it's so easy to be like... It's so easy for those people to just go like, no, you know what I mean? Like, you can be <laughs> unnecessarily, yeah. pointlessly belligerent about it. But to actually go, you know what, actually, this would be a good thing. Let's do it. Actually, it's, it's good that that happens. <laughs> you know? Of course, I, now it's much easier because they're all, it's, all one, it's all one company. So you right. know, like, <laughs> the copyright isn't as big a problem anymore when you own it when one company owns every own single everything <laughs> except Warner Brothers. <laughs> the other film that I really remember like thinking about filmmaking uh, kind of in depth and doing like a textual analysis for the first time was when I was in uh, 10th grade, which is like 15, 16 years old here. Uh, I took an English class on satire and our teacher uh showed us a clockwork orange which i'd never seen for the first time and he was which is a pretty remarkable film to show to a bunch of high school students like (laughs) there's a lot of shit that happens in that movie that (laughs) probably some parents wouldn't be okay with their kids seeing but uh he did it anyway and he was like hey notice how kubrick is doing this here and you know like and really talked about what stuff meant in an artistic way so I, that's the, one of the first two for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're going to talk about um, some of your favorite scenes from film. Let's start with your opening favorite opening scenes from any film. Now, obviously, there are were there other you know it's a good it's a good it's a good it's a good start. Like you know, as I say, there are some 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 are right, some are wrong. You know, there's no, there's no wrong, but some are more correct. It's definitely a correct one. But were the yeah. ones like that you didn't didn't quite make it? That you thought I'd I could choose that one, but you just didn't didn't quite cut the mustard. Yeah, the, the the big one because I didn't know how we'd do it was uh, the op- well. I'd say two. Uh, one is the the opening scene of Back to the Future where he turns all the knobs and then you know, gets <laughs> blown back uh, by the speaker. Uh, but the other one is another uh, '80s kind of sci-fi thing was the opening scene of uh, Buckaroo Banzai, where yeah. you know he's going in the jet car, uh, you know, uh, through the mountain. And that's that has stuck with me. Buck Rubanzai is actually a career inspiration <laughs> to me. I mean, he's it does uh, have all the elements. Does have all the bright elements, yeah, right? So, uh, yeah, like that, that was that was another one for sure. Everything about Buck Rubanzai has stayed with me for forever since since I've seen it since I saw him as a kid in the eighties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's one. Of, that's one of the things I sort of I, I always sort of when I do this show, I think I've already done it, but it's one of the trailers I show before the film starts. I like to show Buckaroo Banzai because if people have seen it, it really engenders massive good. They were like, "Oh, I love Buckaroo Banzai." And if people haven't seen, it, they're like, "What's this? I want to see this film where you know Peter Weller's dressed like Matt Smith as Doctor Who for some reason, <laughs> right? <laughs> in a tight, in, in a sort of weird thing where Jeff Goldblum's dressed as a cowboy and like you know what's going on like it's just amazing and it does yeah, make no sense it's brilliant it's like really proper unnerving 80s thing they have where it's slightly just off kilter so the whole thing is slightly distressing to watch even though it's like a pg yes. and it's all fine like yeah. it's nothing sleazy or creepy about it but there's something about the way it's filmed like when you see the 80s all sat on those stilts and you know it's really horrible but it's yeah but it's still, a, it's, still a pg like it's it's fine that's right and it's got all those amazing 80s character actors, you know, Jeff Goldblum, John Lithgow, Ellen Barkin, uh, uh, Jonathan Banks is in it, right? Uh, <laughs> as, as one of the hospital uh, orderlies. It, it's it's great. Yeah. Is, it Cl- is he Clancy Brown as well? I think he's, is he, is he Clancy Brown? I think he's in uh, it. It's, yes, he is that. Yes, you're yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He's one of the Hong Kong Cavaliers, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's good. So, but, but the one you have chosen... The one you have chosen that we are going to talk about and recreate for you now. Would you like to tell everyone what your favorite opening to any scene ever is? Yeah, so it's a, it's an 80s classic. Uh, it, you know, I don't even need to introduce it. Everyone's seen it. At least, certainly if you're my age, I'm 45. This You grew up in this movie. It's Ferris Bueller's Day Off. The Ferris opening Bueller. scene where, uh, where Ferris is discovered sick in bed uh, by his unsuspecting parents. Yeah, yeah. It's a great movie. Um I mean, I haven't seen I haven't seen it for a while, but I would hope it's because it's it's 
it's what's weird for an 80s. It's actually quite... I don't know if there's any weird content in it if you look back, because a lot of 80s movies are just stuff where you go, that was a weird decision. Not necessarily... Sometimes it's problematic, sometimes it's not problematic, but there's always a weird like philosophy or sort of slant on certain things that like you watch back and you go, that's weird. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. It's, but it is in theory quite a sort of upbeat, joyous film that uh, I would hope that uh, that nothing ruins that. Because when I remember watching it going, this is great. It's just about someone deciding to have like a bit of fun. I mean, Rack yeah. was fun, but like he knows that he's going to just live the rest of his life as a drone. Do you know what I mean? He's going to have like a terrible, yeah, yeah. he's going to have a normal life, which is drudgery and awful. So he's going to have <laughs> right. one last day of fun before he has to go and do his exams and be boring forever. So it is yeah, actually I, quite joyous, even though it's like, oh, another spoiled kid just buggering off and doing shit. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. <70s. laughs> that, the that's place. probably, I mean, just like every other John Hughes uh, movie, like it's, uh, you know, a bunch of upper middle class white people having what aren't actually problems. So that's probably <laughs> the worst thing about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. The worst thing about it. It's nice, but um, it was originally, apparently, uh, they did possibly offer the role originally to Bill Paxton. Uh, oh, really? I didn't know that. Because he was from because he because he was after Weird Science. So I think he turned it down and he regrets yeah, turning yeah. it down because he never got asked for another John Hughes film ever again. <laughs> so I don't know if he's <laughs> yeah. annoyed about it or not. But it's and, weird. Uh, think about like, but uh, yeah, it's great. I mean, talk about a, a career from that too, Alan Ruck. Like, yeah. what uh, an amazing career that guy's had since the. I mean, Cameron was such a uh identifiable character to me growing up and then that guy has just been in everything since the mid 80s up till now yeah yeah well i think as well what helped i think because they were both in um previously they were both in biloxi blues on broadway Mm -hmm. so i think they all like so they spent like before they did this even though they're soon as playing mates they'd just been actually got to hang out for six months on the play so actually they didn't know each other so even though they're playing friends there was a camaraderie which i think you can see that like comes through yeah, for uh, sure. And of course, the famous uh, Charlie Sheen cameo is the uh, drug addled loser. Yep. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, yeah. Yeah, he acts well. He had to stay up for forty-eight hours apparently to uh, get himself into character. <laughs> weird to imagine a time when that would have to be something Charlie Sheen have to pretend to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's good. Oh, have you heard? Have you heard the? There's two two things. One, this was the film that uh, is responsible largely for making. Oh yeah by uh, Yellow, a hit. Oh, yeah. Yep. They were, oh, yeah. Everyone knows oh, the old yeah. Bow, bow. <laughs> yeah. That one. And also, have you heard about the fan theory that um, it's like a fight club thing where Ferris Bueller doesn't actually exist? And it's just oh, uh, no. an alter ego of Cameron. So it's like someone he's made up to deal with his like problems. And actually, the whole thing is Cameron's sick in bed and it's like a fever dream where he's like living out his fantasy of if he could do, if he could be better than himself, he would be uh-huh. very popular. Oh, wow. You know, not so true, but that's something, something to chew on, you know? Interesting, yeah. <laughs> so we're going to move on and we're going to do the opening scene. So for those of you who don't know this scene, he's in bed and it's like quite smart and... Uh, well, so so I, to- I actually... I prepared something for this, so give me give me one moment yes. here. This also is one of the films where uh, they have someone. This, this is what um, Deadpool parodies uh, uh, at the end. Uh, I, I set up a little ah, bed for myself here. Lovely, fantastic. So let's see, because I might need to drop this <laughs> camera just a, a little lower. This is high tech here. There we go. Whoops. There. Okay. Can you guys see that bed? Yeah. 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 I figured I'd just. Pull up the blankie here. Nice. Have my script. Splendid work. There we are. Anyway, so uh, we'll start. So he's in the bedroom. So Mr. Gannon, I will be playing the dad, and Paul Gannon will be playing the mum. Right. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do my best. Yes. Okie dokie. Just, does someone say action? Action. Tom! What's, what's the matter? Oh, it's Ferris. What's wrong? What's wrong? For Christ's sake, look at him, honey. 
We see a close-up of Ferris, an 18-year-old boy. He looks, he's staring lifelessly at the camera. His mouth open, his eyes are bugged out, his tongue is fat and dried his mouth. He's laying in bed on his side. <laughs> Ferris is <laughs> Joyce Bueller, standing by the bedside. They're in the late 40s, early 50s. Handsome, upper middle class parents. They're both dressed for work. Ferris? He doesn't have a fever, but he says his stomach hurts and he's seeing spots. <laughs> What's the matter, Ferris? Papa. Honey, feel his hands. They're cold and clammy. Ugh. I'm fine. I can get up. No, 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 no. I'm going to test today. No. I have to take it. I want to go to a good college so I can have a fruitful life. Honey, you're not going to go to school like this now. His sister walks in. Oh, oh, fine. What's this? What's his problem? Uh, he doesn't feel well. Yeah, right. Drive her out. <laughs> what am I doing? Drive her out, out and you can fertilize the lawn. Jeannie, is that you, Jeannie? I can't see that far. Jeannie? Je Jeannie? Bite the big one, Junior. Thank you, Jeannie. You get to school. God almighty. You're letting him stay at home? I can't believe this. If I was bleeding out of my eyes, you guys would make me go to school. This is so unfair. Jeannie, please don't be upset with me. You have your health. Be thankful. <laughs> oh. oh. That's it. I want out. That's it. I want out of this family. <laughs> uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I'm okay. I'll just sleep. Maybe I'll have an aspirin around noon. Now, listen. I'm showing some houses to that family from Vermont today, so I'll be in the area. Now, my office will know just where I am if you need me, okay? Okay. Okay. I'll check on you too, pal. It's nice to know that I have such loving, caring parents. They're both very special people. <laughs> now, you get better, pumpkin. Okay, pumpkin. <laughs> I'll be at home at six sharp if you need anything. Call. Ring a ding ding. <laughs> we love you, sweetie. I love you too, Mac Mac. Call if you need us. They bought it. Rock music starts. Incredible. One of the worst performances of my career, and they never doubted it for a second. How could I possibly be expected to handle school on a day like this? <laughs> this is my ninth sick day this semester. It's getting pretty tough coming up with new illnesses. If I go for 10, I'm probably gonna have to barf up a lung, so I better make this one count. The key to faking out parents is the clammy hands. It's a good non-specific symptom. I'm a big believer in it. A lot of people will tell you that a good phony fever is a deadlock, but then you get a nervous mother, you could wind up in a doctor's office. That's worse than school. You fake a stomach cramp, and when you're bent over, moaning and wailing, you lick your palms. It's a little childish and stupid, but then, so is high school. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you can miss it. Yay! We did it. Excellent work. Excellent work. Fantastic, fantastic. That's great. And if you've not seen it, that's exactly how it is. <laughs> I nailed it. <laughs> that, that the film starts. <laughs> So, all right, fantastic! Look at this. Back. <laughs> back to where I was. He's back to where he was. Look at that, seamless. <laughs> so, <laughs> move on to your favorite, uh, like it's basically scene from anything. So, were there any like, sort of scenes that didn't quite make it that you thought you might have for the middle one here? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, once it <laughs> it was just too short. It again was a buckaroo ponds. I think it's the one where they're walking <laughs> through the lab. And yeah. there's a watermelon, and someone just goes, "What's that watermelon doing there?" And the other guy says, "I'll tell you later." <laughs> <laughs> that was it. It was so short, though. Yeah. Well, I feel like I feel like you've all, I feel like theory is so short. You've technically just done it anyway. You <laughs> <laughs> yeah. had a, bo a bonus scene. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yes. Yeah. So that, that was the main one. Have you chosen? What scene have you chosen for us? 
Uh, well, I wanted to pick something that, because I am lucky enough to be doing the show with some real honest to God British people, I wanted something that encapsulated the America versus uh, you know UK kind of uh, rivalry. So I chose the "Would that it were to Would that it were so simple" scene from Hail Caesar. <laughs> yes, excellent, excellent. See, it's like, I, yeah, Hail Caesar is is a it's a weird it's a weird film because I. I like, I like Hail Caesar. Like, I watched it, and all the way through I'm watching it, I'm thinking, this is great. Like, I'm loving everything that everything that happened in Hail, the Hail yep. Caesar. And then when it finished, I didn't leave feeling like I'd watched a brilliant film, even though all the way through it, I was <laughs> like, this is great. But when I left, I didn't feel like I'd watched something great. It was like I left, and I was like, ah, oh, actually, that wasn't, there's like, that's not, doesn't really work. Do you know, like, I don't know, like, I don't mean to be yeah. mean. I no, like, no, no, yeah. I feel that way with basically every Coen Brothers movie until I see it again. Yeah. And then <laughs> I'm like, I remember actually very clearly seeing Big Lebowski in theaters and walking out being like, okay, um, yeah. that was odd. And then six months to a year later, having this like undefinable urge to watch it again, being like, well, I didn't really like it, but okay. And then seeing it again and absolutely loving it. So that exact thing, it happens to me at really every single Coen Brothers movie, except for an after reading, which I just hate. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, but the Hell Caesar the second time was like, oh yeah, okay, here we go. I love it. Yeah, it's nice. But also, it's just um, what I like about this scene is it's like how funny Ray Fiennes is. And then you think about Ray Fiennes. We did because uh, one of the scenes we did before uh, previous episode, we did uh, something from the Grand Budapest Hotel. Mm. Yeah. Oh, and nice. it's like Ray Fiennes is funny, and it's nice because people always talk about like, oh, he's a comedian and he can do serious. Yeah, but it's very rare that you find, like when you find that sort of sort of normal classical trained actor who you then realise can be funny. That that's a real joy for me when you realise that you can get people like Ray Fiennes to do comedy and be good at yeah. it. Well, I really, yeah, I love totally. That's, that's, he's that's amazing in this scene. He's yeah. very subtle and funny. Yeah. yeah. And then no one ever really sort of gives people like him, you know, credit for doing that, like those sorts of actors credit for being funny. Do you know, like it's, right. it's great. He really makes it because he's just very polite and very charming, but it's, uh, it is a great thing. Yeah. So this is like, so I guess it's like, I mean, I have no idea how to pronounce his name. Alden, Alden Aaron, uh, 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 yeah. He, yeah. Han Solo. Yeah, Han Solo. Han <laughs> Solo. <laughs> Han Solo is talking to M. <laughs> yeah. So I, I did, I did bring something for this too. So you need to give me one. Yeah, second, of course. If, if, if you would. So you might, you might, guys might remember uh, in this scene. So it's set in on a movie set, and there's a what would you call it? It's like a maybe a 19th century drawing room type. Yeah. Thing. Mm. It's like a sort of posh person. It's a posh person's lounge. It's That's the right, background yeah. to every Rock Hudson film. Yeah. yeah so basically, indeed. if people haven't seen it, um, they're trying to find someone to be in this movie and they want to make uh, Alden Ehrenreich a star, but he's essentially like a sort of silent movie, just does cowboy movies, and they go, like, no, no, he'll be fine. So Ray Fiennes, the sort of posh British director who does drawing room comedies, like Broadway smashes, has got to put a sort of cowboy in his posh <laughs> posh like yeah, so they, like movie so they dress him up yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i have nice. decided oh, to wear snazzy a jacket and tie thank you very much that's good and so he doesn't even really know because the movie he makes how to enter a room or do anything does he like so he doesn't even know he's supposed to sit or and he can't talk no, he just yeah he's not really a he's got, he's, so he's like just, a cow, <laughs> cowboy type guy he's basically uh like a sort of ricky uh, nelson type isn't he like a ricky nelson yeah yeah that that kind of, or maybe even like a uh, uh it's john wayne isn't it in the last uh the, uh, the ten commandments or whatever it is it's, like, it's a little bit also like uh dicaprio and once upon a time in hollywood that yeah. sort of style actor too yeah he's great and he's really good in it as well like i should point out he is really good also it's quite yeah. difficult to pretend to be a bad actor if you're not actually, but you know, to be a good enough actor to prove that you can pretend to be a bad actor, is yeah. <laughs> well, this is 
this is where I have one up on Alden Ehrenreich because I am actually <laughs> a terrible actor. And so I think I'm going to nail this. We're just going to we're just going to go. We're just going to do the best we can. <laughs> I think yep. Hopefully, we show the middle. So I'll explain what's going on. So we have a scene. It's the interior of a parlor. So we're doing. It's a film called Merrily We Dance. And so the clapper boy bangs the thing. Merrily we dance, 27 Apple take two. Wow. Action. Oh, Monty, come join me on the divan. It seems the Laker is a no-show, which is simply a bore, but I'll partner you in bridge. Why the pout? Would that it were so sample? Cut. Uh, very good. Uh, very good. Uh, come. Come. All right. Let's try this. Your line, just say it as I would say it. Say your line as I'm about to, just as I'm about to. Sure. Okay. Would that it were so simple. Would that it were so simple. Would that it were so simple. <laughs> would that it were so simple. My dear boy, why do you say that? Why do you say twere? Well, you said said like I said. Uh, yes. Would that it were so simple. Would that it were so simple. Would that it were so simple. What? Would, would, would that would would that it were so simple. No, no, no. Watch my mouth. Would that it were so simple. Would that it <laughs> were so simple. Keep your head still. Would that it were so simple. Would that it were so simple. Would that it were so simple. What? what I'm trying to say that, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence. I thought uh, a minute ago it was Lawrence. No, we can <laughs> use Christian as my good dear boy. Lawrence is fine, just as I call you Hobie. Okay. So, would that it were so simple? Would that it were... Keep your hands so down. <laughs> now, would that it were so simple? <laughs> would that it were so simple? Trippingly. No, don't say trippingly. Say the line trippingly. W w would that it was so would simple? Would that it were so simple? Would that it was 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 so simple? Like rueful, 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 ru rueful. Would that it was so simple? Would that it was so simple? Would that it was so simple? Simple. Would that it was so simple? Simple, you know. Would that it was so simple? Or soulful, or you could say soulful, roof soulful. Would that it was so simple? Would that it was so? Why are you doing that? Why? What are you doing this? What are you doing? What are you doing this for? Would would that it was? Just keep still. See. Amazing. I like it when the Coen Brothers make a new movie, The Witted Sandling's Perfect Movie. This could be the film within the film within the film. Oh, I enjoyed that very much. That was great, yes. And an amazing, Richard, an amazing Ray Barnes, really. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. I mean, it has been said, but it has been said, I am the Essex Ray they say. If they, well, they, they don't, but if we could start making that a thing online, that'd be really helpful. <laughs> Hashtag. Hashtag Essex Ray Fines. <laughs> <laughs> Although I would have to call myself Ralph. I would have to commit to Ralph Fines. <laughs> have you guys, uh, have you heard the bit? Do you ever listen to how, to how Did This Get Made? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you heard the Jason Statham in LA bit they do? No. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a it's, massive fan. Uh, will do. It, it's... Uh, you, I, you look it up. I'm sure they have clips of it online. I'm not even going to try to do the Statham accent, but it's Statham <laughs> basically giving people directions to talk about very insider stuff about LA traffic and uh, and streets. So look up Jason Statham in LA. How did this get made? It's really funny. Yeah. You tell me, the Germans? <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, yeah, yeah, that's great. That was the thing. Because I remember when I went to America for the first time. Uh, when I, when I, it was as an older man, they went, the key, Rich, the key, very yeah. sort of, uh, you know, binary approach. They said, uh, if you're talking to, uh, if you're talking to like blokes, mm -hmm. talk like, you know, like milk, you sort of pretend you're Jason Statham. Uh, like, All right, mate, you know, let's go and have a beer. And then if you're talking to <laughs> any women, pretend you're Hugh Grant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like, I can see that. Would you like a drink? 
Oh, really nice to meet you. How are you? All right, mate, let's go. Then you basically just make friends with everybody. That's what they did. But, you know, yeah. so I don't know. I mean, that technically, well, unfortunately, that's sort of technically true as well. <laughs> when, I, when I lived out there, because of the accent, because of the Liverpool thing, every American I met instantly thought I was related to a Beatle. <laughs> and I didn't tell them I wasn't, to be no, fair. Exactly. So, never, never, never. Never, never, could, never, yeah, never, never talk people out of their mis, mis, <laughs> you know, misassumption, unless, of course, it's a bad one. <laughs> if it's flattering, just run with it. That's what I say. <laughs> the only ones I ever get are the fake compliments. I remember, like, talking about that, it's not the same, but I was a member of the first Edinburgh I ever did. I was walking across the George the Fifth Bridge, it was like two in the morning, and there was this Scottish bloke, and he was like, Ah, it's you, isn't it? It's you. And I was like, I mean, I don't think so. Like, you know, like is you, is you? You know, you did them well now because I mean, I'm just doing a show up here. I'm not like, you know, you, 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 have you seen my show? No, no. And then he couldn't work out who I, who he thought I was. <laughs> and I didn't know who he thought I was. So the more I was trying to talk him, like, to explain that it wasn't who he thought I was, he was getting angry thinking that I was just being a dick and not admitting that I was him. <laughs> I, I was to tell him that I wasn't. He's like, it is you. I don't do it, Billy. It is you. Why? It is you. I'm like, it's not me. I don't know who you think I am. So there's probably some like, bloke in Scotland who's convinced he met whoever it was. <laughs> it was a yeah. massive... Like Brian one. Blessed's a right prick. Yeah. <laughs> uh, were you not standing in front of a poster of your own fringe show at the time? Oh, this was, I didn't I didn't have this was 2006. I didn't have posters from a fringe show other than in the venue toilet. <laughs> <laughs> this is when the fringe this is when this is when it was the fringe. It was an honest fringe oh, back oh, in our day. Yeah. Oh, this is when it was, you know, this is when this is before it was a trade fair masquerading as an arts festival. <laughs> So, but anyway, I digress. I digress. <laughs> We're moving into endings of movies now. Move ends of movies is important. So, were there any endings you couldn't think to? You know, you couldn't quite couldn't quite bring yourself to uh, to choose that you wanted to do. Uh, yes, actually, uh, I wanted to do all three endings from Clue, and yes. I oh, thought I thought nice. it was a bit, especially the the the, the one. Now I'm going to go home and sleep with my wife. Best final line in anything ever, that. Yeah. Right? Uh, Michael McKean. And, you know, just a, a great thing. And I was like, you know what? That's a little, it's a little much to do all three. And any one of them by themselves, by mm. itself, doesn't quite have the impact. Yeah. Uh, as the, or it could have happened like this, you know, like, yeah. uh, like you see it now. Yeah. No, what you should have done was the middle of Clue so we can recreate the first part of Clue in the second <laughs> part of Clue. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you could just recreate all of Clue via Zoom. <laughs> yeah, so that'll be someone will pitch that. They'll do a murder mystery via Zoom. That'll be the next pitch you watch. Oh, someone's already got to be pitching that, right? Yeah, that's, sure. that's someone that, doing that. That. Ten angry Zooms like Clue and Murder by Death, and just do everything and have it all at the same time. Just have everybody. Yeah. Yeah. You've already got Corona zombies. Someone would have done that. Zoom <laughs> yeah. I mean, I didn't think about it, but Zoom is perfectly set up for like a time code kind of yeah. thing, right? Mm -hmm. I bet someone's yeah. got something like that going on. Yeah. Very exciting. Very exciting times. <laughs> We're living in the future. Yeah. <laughs> no. What a time to be alive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'd rather be reading about this in a history book. Perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there we go. So, uh, you know, just think of everybody else. I'm, I'm basically all right. But so we're going to do... <laughs> ending, speaking of uh, speaking of cheery, 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 cheery... Social, <laughs> what, what Good time. Your final, Good time. your final end scene. Uh, yes, I've, I've chosen uh, the ending scene from the comedy seven. By David uh, Fincher. David Fincher. It's a laugh riot. Oh uh, yeah, real uh, fun. I do like, I do like, do like the film Seven. I haven't seen it for a while, but I, you know, it was one of those films you watched it. And it was, I remember really liking it. Yeah, but it's one of those things where it's what I, you know, it's one of those films that because it's like famously dark in the way that the studios were, were like uncomfortable with the material. And then, it's something, but then like you watch it and you're like, I mean. It's really, really good, but I do not feel disturbed by watching any of this content. And then you go, should I have felt disturbed by what? Because everyone just keeps going about how dark this is, and you're like, I didn't really. Yeah, didn't but really, like, didn't we've seen your video show. 
<laughs> yeah, it's like it's like PG thirteen fucked up, not actual yeah. fucked yeah. up. Right. Yeah, yeah. But rated <laughs> like yeah. rated like right. R because you know it's it's bleak. But yeah, I mean, I really liked it. I was like my. Um, you know, it's got the great Nine Inch Nails opening, David Bowie ending, yep. credit. You know, the credits go up. It looks like a serial killer's written the credits. It's brilliant. Yep. And I think, and yeah, also this ending. Right? I was going to say, the, the thing about the ending scene is just how well constructed it is and set up by the rest of the film. I mean, like, like yeah. many uh, Fincher things, it thinks it's smarter and deeper than it is. But... Uh, <laughs> You know, it's uh, it, you still can't deny that the, the ending is perfectly set up by the rest of the film. It, it's it's yeah. really really great. And it is, and it's yeah, and it's like I think it's uh, like I think well, obviously not spoiler alert, but I think that it's like it's the only on screen death, isn't it? I think everybody else who like like is that all true? The, maybe all yeah, the, like John Doe never kills anybody on screen. It's mm. all just oh, I didn't realize that victims. You never actually see him. Yeah, doing, which is quite weird for a serial killer movie to actually not to focus on the investigation, and the aftermath, rather than because usually there's quite a lurid fascination yeah. with the execution of the serial killeriness, isn't there? Usually, and it's quite nice to have it about being two detectives who yeah solve it. I quite like that, yeah. So that the other thing I quite liked was that I like the, the way that you get a film like this. Because um, I remember cause we were talking last week about how much I love Alien Three, and um, yeah, Alien Three, Alien Three. And I remember yeah. after that, like Fincher was like, "You'll never work in this town again. You're terrible. Like, you know, like you, you know, you made a shit Alien. You know, you're rubbish. You'll never work again." Then he was like, "Well, actually, I, I have, I have, uh, I have made something. What? I have seven. No, oh, we were just kidding. Come on back. You know, like, <laughs> lovely life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. And, you know, there was a thing, I think he was, they were like, we're getting David Finch. I don't know if I want to make a movie because I like such a bad time with Fox Studio. I think they're like the person who got him involved with like, They're all fucking idiots. Just work for me. Like, you're great. And it was like that sort of thing. Like, And I think it yeah. rained all the time. So uh, they, they made it rain so they would never have to worry about there being bad weather. So they just made it rain all the time. So even when they had good weather, oh, that's they awesome. bad weather. So it was it's easier really to have it rain the whole time. Obviously, it's bleak and depressing, but it helped. And I think because it was such a quick turnaround, Brad Pitt turned up and the first day he was filming, it was raining. So they were like, well, we're just going to make it rain because we can't. Really? Stop. Oh, I didn't know that. I think oh. he was going to go and make 12 Monkeys. So they had to, like, uh, like you know, they, only had, they didn't have him for like months. Yeah. You know? Another like, great ending monkeys. scene. Yeah, Twelve Monkeys. This is like the sort of birth of the Brad Pitt as like the Brad Pitt we actually know and love. Yeah, the, the fun Brad Pitt doing crazy, wacky like shit. Because like you know, if you're Brad Pitt and you've got all this money, why would you just keep making Legends of the Fall all the time? You know, you want right. to do something like this, don't you? You know, and it's great that he did. I remember seeing Twelve Monkeys, Brad Pitt, and before I saw Seven. Uh, and uh, just being like, oh, wow, that guy can actually like do other stuff rather than just, you know, be hot and hang around. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like that. So it's just so nice that he wants to do other stuff as well. Because some people are quite happy just to be slightly, you know, bland leading men. You know what I mean? Like, or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Girls. And it's great that he's actually put himself out there. And I'm like, yeah, this is a great film. Did you watch the the 12 Monkeys uh, TV show? Uh, no, it's supposed to be good, though. It's pretty great, yeah. I mean, it, it 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 the first season, like many things, is a little like hit and miss, but they really expand the mythology a lot. I, I thought it was really fun. It's got lots of people in it that I like, so I probably will will watch it. Uh, yeah, big, yeah. Fan of, big fan of Jay Carnes, I think, who's uh, mm -hmm. was Dutch in the Shield and uh, many other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it it uh, I forget her name, Stephanie Robinson, I think, who's also in Schitt's Creek. Right. Uh, I can't remember. I might be getting that actor's name wrong, but yeah, she's great too. Yeah, yeah. So it's great. But also, so go back to seven. This is interesting. I remember I, uh, uh, the Brad Pitt wouldn't sign on unless they kept the ending, which I think is really good as well because it, because they didn't. Oh, want, really? They were thinking they, the ending's too bleak and depressing, and then Brad Pitt was like, "Well, I'm you know, if you change it, I'm not, I'm out." You know, like right. the so everyone sort of solid like the solidarity for keeping the ending was good. I think there's like that yeah. weird Hemingway quote at the end, which is kind of like a fudging the sort of trying to make it not so dis like bleak and ending, but. Yeah, uh, I mean, it was, it was very, very yeah, no, sorry. No, no, I was you say it was very prescient because now everybody wants to kill Kevin Spacey. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
when I, I remember when I saw, yeah, I remember when I saw when I saw Seven, I knew it was Kevin Spacey because of his voice on the phone because I used to be a massive Kevin Spacey fan because you know, there was a time when you could be. Oh, on the bright yeah. side, his name's not actually on the film or the credits, so you can just pretend it's someone else. He's not yeah. officially Is listening. that true? Oh, good. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because because he's a surprise when he turns up, so he's not... Uh, yeah. The idea was it was a surprise, and all the press had to not release that he was in it, so when he turns up, you're like, oh, my God, it's Kevin Spacey. When he walks into the station. Kevin Spacey yeah, yeah, yeah. Up, oh, my God. But did people think that meant they were going to react like Norman Cheers, where he walks in and goes, <laughs> <laughs> Officer, yeah. you're looking for me. <laughs> and it turns out that he's actually a monster in real life. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I did not need much. Not yeah, awful. But it is still a good scene. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> so, uh, are you so so you're gonna be you're gonna be Kevin Spacey? Are you? I'm gonna be John Doe. And actually, I, I looked around for like an orange thing, an orange shirt. Uh, and I don't have that many brightly colored clothes. So this is the best I could come up with. <laughs> and I'm going to do this kneeling. See, I could have done it. By now. <laughs> by that no, I, now, now we're back. Yeah, it's, it's, we were getting the band back together. I <laughs> so, yeah. So I feel I'll like, be, I'll feel like there's, somewhere there's, a, there's a wedding missing a band. <laughs> <laughs> it's Copacabana all night tonight. Well, if I just play the drums, don't want to know I'm not wearing my shirt. You just carry on, guys. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I'll so I'll be um, I'll be um, I'll be Brad Pitt, obviously. So that's Mills, yeah. Yeah, and you're Somerset, right? Freeman, but uh, Freeman, yeah. I would advise against an impression. I will be performing him in such a way that you will not believe that there'll be any co co coincidence of his p persona. What I'm saying is I'm going to do it in a northern comedian's voice. Uh -huh. Great, perfect. Why that, not? That, that, I would that'll help with the gravitas. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Also, I only have yeah, three really... voices and I've done one already. <laughs> I was going to say really emphasize the, the Liverpool. Like, I think that's really, that's really yeah. Throw your back into it, Paul. Throw your back right. into yeah. the stars. So right. we're in a field. Somerset stares at a box and pulls out switchblade. He cuts the side of the box, turns around and cuts the other side. He opens it and pauses. There's blood. <laughs> Captain Mills holding his gun, looking at Somerset. John Doe is on his knees behind him. You've made quite a life for yourself, Detective. You should be very proud. Shut the fuck up, you piece of shit. <laughs> He his hand open in the box. There's lots of stuff in the box. It's awful. He radios the radios the police, the helicopter. California, stay away from here. Stay away from here now. Do not come in here. Whatever you hear, stay away. John Doe has the upper hand. Bills! Here he comes. Put your gun down. <laughs> what? I wish I could have lived like you did. Shut up! Put the gun down! Put it away! What the fuck are you talking about? Do you hear me, detective? I'm trying to tell you how much I admire you. And your pretty wife. <laughs> what? Tracy. What did you fucking say? It's disturbing how easily a member of the press can purchase information about a man in your precinct. Put your gun down! I visited your home this morning after you left. I tried to play husband. I tried to taste the life of a simple man. Put it away. It didn't work out. So I took a souvenir. Her pretty head. Give me a gun. What's going on over there? Put the gun down. <laughs> <laughs> Let's tell you with the box. Who is in the box? Because I envy your normal life. Put the gun down, David. It seems that envy is my sin. No, oh, what's in the box? Not till you give me the gun. What's in the box? Just give me the gun. I just told you. You lie! You're fucking lying! It's what he wants! He wants you to shoot him! <laughs> no! No! You tell me that's not true! That's not true! Become vengeance, David. No! She's alright! You tell become, me! Become wrath. 
Tell me, she's all right. <laughs> you made her a suspect, David. No. She begged for her life, detective. Shut up. <laughs> for her life and the life of the baby inside her. No. <laughs> oh, he didn't know. Give me the gun, David. <laughs> David, if you kill him, he will win. Ah, thank God, thank God. Ah, ah. <laughs> See. That was oh, brilliant. Oh, not a dry eye in the house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was emotional. I'm exhausted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was it. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause, Mr. Brian Wicks. <laughs> <laughs> So before we go, uh, Mr. Mr. Brian, is there anywhere people can find you online? Is there any like where can they find you? What would you suggest? Yeah. There? Uh, well, you can find me on uh, socials at, at bwech b w e c h t, and if you look for uh, Ninja Sex Party, that's my my band and uh, comedy channel and stuff like that. So you can find us on YouTube uh, and uh, and all the socials at at Ninja Sex Party. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Fantastic. And before we go, is there anything that is there anything pressing from Facebook that needs to be dealt with, uh, Holly? Um, Sarah Hollins was loving the Seven sketch. Oh, good, <laughs> yeah. good. She said oh, Seven correct. is art. It's very, very pretty. Um, was it my <laughs> my performance in particular that she liked? Probably. I think it probably right. was. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think well, that's you, what you were. You were the you know you were you were the, the the core the central core of that. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we were just satellites orbiting your your. your <laughs> 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 Another star yeah. in Hollywood's firmament. <laughs> we were also oh, taking bets on whether the show was going to actually end on time tonight. No, <laughs> time is a is an irrelevant uh, irrelevant concept. <laughs> it's certainly yeah, it's 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 never, it's never ended show. at the same time. So there is no time for it to end on. So uh, you know, who, uh, well, let's work out. Is anybody is anybody specifying a time? I'll see if I can help them win. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm happy to drag this out for two and a half more hours if it means someone gets. <laughs> I mean. It's not like anyone needs to uh, sort of pack up the dungeon basement, is it? So um... <laughs> that's true. So I, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. So, probably As I, tomorrow, I... so you know. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, if you have enjoyed this, uh, please like the Facebook page for more updates and information. Uh, watch this on YouTube when I upload it. Uh, nice shared, it, but... but it was good. If you have enjoyed it, uh, you can go to Kofi Kofi Coffee dot com slash Richard Sandling. Still don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, and you can buy me a kebab. Uh, donate some <laughs> because I'm uh, not in this for my health. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is this is, this is even though it may seem incredibly self indulgent. This is this is all for your benefit. So <laughs> <laughs> so uh, please please donate some money so uh, to keep to keep me in kebabs. Uh, I need a new haircut. So that's perfect. <laughs> if you like Paul Gannon and you like Brian Wett, you can also donate some money to them if you can find them on. I'm sure they'd be delighted if you gave them some money, but mainly give me money. I, I would like any of the acts. If you want to be in the front row, then obviously you can. There will be a thing on my Ko fi page where you can find that out. It's been delightful uh, to have you all watching. Thank you very much for your time. I very much enjoyed it. It's very hot. Uh, it seems incredible. <laughs> I'm sweating, sweating awfully. Uh, or well, I'm not sure. You don't need to know that, but it's just awful where I'm sitting. Uh, but thank you very, very much for coming. Before we go, a round of applause for everyone you saw. You saw Mr. Paul Gannon. Woo! Mr. Brian Wax. My name is Richard Sandling. Thank you very much for coming. I'll see you next week. Farewell. <laughs>